This podcast is made possible through donations from listeners like you and our partners at Tallman Equipment, where they pride themselves on equipping their customers with the tools they need to get the job done right. They are dedicated to set the standard for quality, convenience, and reliability. At Tallman, your opinion is important to them. Rate and review any product or tool you've used on their new website at tallmanequipment.com. Line 11 Clothing Company. Making apparel for our first responders with a positive message to patriots that you can be proud of. The proceeds of the cost goes to helping our foundation ignite the fire for father engagement. Give them a follow at Line11Clothing on Instagram. And last but not least, Monzingo Knives. Each knife is created with craftsmanship that only a tradesman could provide. Find them on Instagram at Monzingo Knives and get your American-made Monzingo knife today. Welcome to the Show Up Dad. This is a podcast for hardworking fathers. At the Show Up Dad, we recognize that fathers providing for their children is certainly important. But when men truly understand their unique role and gain the knowledge and skills to be great fathers, they can transform and impact future generations. Our guest today is none other than Trent McIntyre. For more than two decades, Trent has been helping people gain back their mobility, a story he knows all well. Born with a mild form of cerebral palsy, Trent experienced pain and stiffness every day from the time he was a child. The methods Trent discovered to repair his own body also became the foundation for what would be his life's work. Trent is married and has two daughters. Welcome to the show, Trent. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. I just wanted to start things off, Trent, with you just opening up to our audience and telling about your childhood and what you remember about it, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. You know, I, I, um, I grew up the most of my time um, on a farm in uh, sort of southern Michigan. Yeah, that's where I have the most memories. But prior to that, we actually moved around quite a bit. Um, you know, having, having experienced um, mostly until, until the farm, having a single mom. And then once we moved to the farm, my biological father actually died so I was seven when he had passed. And so there's like, you know, my, my most memories are on the farm and with, with my mom and my stepdad at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how was that relationship with your stepdad? Well, I mean, it was, it was, um, it wasn't, it wasn't great, but it wasn't that it was contentious. It was just that, um, I think that I just came with his new wife, you know, um, he wasn't really excited about kids and didn't really know how to interact with kids. And um, so it was like, I was a bit of a stranger in the house for him, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to ask you, Trent, um, obviously that's, that's very hard, especially on a child when they lose their, their father at such a young age, you know, my younger brother, he passed away and he left three daughters mm. and uh, we just see the devastation from that. Um, how did it affect you? Losing your father. Yeah, you know, it, it really is this ripple effect that goes into my, my whole life. You know, I when I was when I was young, um, I mean, it, it's it sounds just as terrible as it is actually. And I've I've done a lot of growing and working through all of these things, but the reality is that I only have one memory of seeing my father, and that was actually at his funeral. So if that speaks to my childhood, that somehow seemed appropriate for my first, you know, like. Be, being with my, my, my biological dad was at his funeral when he died um, because, because I had no memory of him. Um, I, I don't know at what point my mom had separated, but I, I wasn't aware of it. So, mm, mm. Man, that's crazy that you don't even have like a recollection, a, a recollection of that. Um, it's sorry to hear. Um, what did your stepdad teach you that well, you I'll share? Tell you. Yeah, he, he, he taught me a lot in, 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 a, in a very sort of like indirect and non-father kind of a relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, one thing that really sticks with me, um, you know, because it was a farm that, you know, he had one day, one day off a month. So mm-hmm. there was one Sunday a month that he got off. And then that rotated through the family because it's a, it was a bicentennial farm in the same family for over 100 years. And you know, our, our farm and property and all that was bigger than the town we were attached to. It was a pretty good sized farm. And so there was a lot of work. And so learning, 
learning really what hard work is, man, oh man, he, he's putting in, you know, 90 plus hour work weeks and, you know, up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning to go milk the cows because they've got to be milked at a certain time twice a day, whether he feels like it or not. And so I think, I think that that work ethic um, was really important to see. But I also think that um, something that I learned in hindsight was that you don't always have to work harder and longer hours to get better outcomes. You know, I think, you know, I would, I would take that work ethic of like, go, 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 go. And then you realize that you end up missing some things along the way because you're working so much and so hard. You know, and Trent, I, I can't agree with you more. Um, some of the hardest working people I've ever met are dirt poor and they right. like almost pride themselves in, Oh man, I'm such a hard worker. I'm such a hard worker. And it's like, yeah, but you're spinning your wheels. You're not getting ahead. Yeah. Right. You know, so I agree with you. I mean, sometimes hard work doesn't necessarily have a yield, a great harvest. You, you know what I mean? If you're not working smart, you know, my, my father always taught us work smarter, not harder, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I will, I will say that on, on the positive side, you know, learning, learning how to see things um, for what they are. He had a very, um, a very interesting expression that I didn't understand as a, as a kid. He would say, well, you know, this and that happened because it was, it was too easy. And when things are too easy, you just don't see them. You don't recognize it. And, and when things become complicated, it seems like they're better, but you know, if something is really easy, it actually can be really hard to see. And I remember um, one Easter, uh, you know, we, we had, um, you know, the Easter bunny comes and hides the eggs, right? Yeah. So he, he decides that he's going to hide one egg. So we find all the eggs, except for the one egg that he hid. And we couldn't find the egg all day. And it wasn't until that evening that we found the egg that he had with clear tape, taped it to the picture that hung above the TV. And he said, you couldn't find it because it was too easy. And, you know, I didn't get it then. Then I thought he was making fun of us, but he really had such a great point because, you know, sometimes <laughs> the hardest, most challenging thing is just so easy. It's right in front of you. You don't even realize it. Hmm, man, that's a, that's a good analogy right there. That is, that's true. I mean, I never really thought about it myself, but just thinking about, you know, and just that visual that you shared with us. I mean, man, it's right in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, I liken that too, to like, I remember sometimes I would tell my kids or even the apprentices I had at work, I'd be like, go find this tool. I'd tell them exactly where it was or even a bolt or whatever. I knew it was there. I had just seen it there. I send them there. They look all around. And it's right in front of them. They don't, they don't see it. Right. Right. You know, and my, my old man used to get mad at me too. He'd be like, Oh, go to my tool shed and get this. And, you know, I mean, you know, how the old guys are, they, they had their tools to where the dust would like make an outline. Right. <laughs> so you knew where that tool went back and it better be in its place. Well, that, that was how my father was, you know? And, right. Right. So yeah, we, I wouldn't see it. And, you know, I don't know if it's because you get in such a hurry or whatever, you know what I mean? You're just not really paying attention. It's too easy. Like you said, and you just miss those little details, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And this was coming from a man who had an eighth grade education. You know, he dropped out of school uh, at eighth grade because he was, he was able to, and then mm -hmm. in his mind, he's going to work on the farm his whole life. So why should he stay in school? Didn't mean he wasn't wise. Didn't mean he wasn't smart. Mm -hmm. He just wasn't, you know, school educated. No, and, and I always say too, I mean, you can't teach common sense. Right, right. You know what I mean? And common sense will take you far. I promise. I've seen it. <laughs> you, know, you could have this great education and everything, but if you have a little bit of common sense, you know, you're going to go, you're going to go pretty far, you know, but uh, <laughs> so it sounds like you had a pretty awesome, you know, childhood growing up on the farm and stuff like that. What, what kind of farming did you guys do? Was it just grains or? It's a, it's a dairy, it's a dairy farm. And so we had uh, Holsteins and, you know, we had, a, we had a couple hundred cows and the whole farm and, um, you know, it was run by, you know, my dad, his brother, and then their father, mostly uh, there was, you know, sometimes where there'd be some hired hands that would come in now and then, but mostly the kids were the help when it came mm -hmm. to putting up hay, doing smaller things around the farm, but they were in charge of the big tasks and, 
taking care of everything. Do you feel like, cause I know for me, like I used to have to pick up hay and irrigate and everything like that. Cause I, I grew up on a farm as well. Um, do you feel that like gives kids like a, a better, how, how would I put this? a better sense of responsibility, I guess would be, you know what I mean? Just, just knowing that you have to do it right the first time and stuff. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. You know, I, I would say that um, there's, there's not much about putting a pay that I enjoyed. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. for sure. Um, because it was during the summer. So it took up a lot of my summer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was, I was paid for it. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't uh, unpaid labor. I, I was paid something for it. And as a kid, that was a lot of money, even though it was a few bucks an hour kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the thing that I think that I learned the most is that, you know, it's 7 a.m. It's time to go. And you got to show up and you got to do the thing that you're expected to do. And, you know, on our, on our farm, there wasn't a lot of training. There was a lot of expectation. And I think for my stepdad and the rest of the relatives that were like born on the farm, mm-hmm. they had been around it enough to know by the time they were 10, 11, 12, 13, what to do and how to do it. So coming in late, you know, there's, there's some things that I think that I wasn't aware of mm-hmm. that I learned real quick. Um, and there were some things that I knew not to give me because <laughs> I didn't learn them very quick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, there's only one way that hay can be put up and it's got to be put up correctly. Otherwise, the whole thing is going to fall down and they're not going to be able to access the food they need to give to the cows. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, you do learn. You learn quick. And I think too, as parents, um... I don't know if you do it. We, we do, we, we tend to have these expectations of our kids. Like I remember telling my daughter, you know, at your age, I was chopping wood and making kindling for my mom. So she can start the stove and cook on it and everything, you know? And it's like, we remember the stuff we had to do. And then we try to put that on our kids and it's like, man, they're just, they're just not like that. You know what I mean? Times are, are different you know, and sometimes we get kind of upset. I know for me, I, I turned really critical with my children. You know what I mean? I'm like, Oh, come on, man, you can do it. You know? And which is not wrong to get them to be motivated, but when you're turning that critical and, and then you're just crushing, you, I mean, I remember times I would just see my, my daughter, for example, and I just see myself just crushing her because she couldn't do something. You know what I mean? Right. And uh, yeah. why is that? Why do you think we do that? Well, you know, I think it takes a lot of, a lot of empathy to put yourself in their shoes Mm -hmm. with the life that they've gone through and what they might know or not know, or be able to to call Cause you know, we we have our experience. And so I know, you know, for me, when I'm seven and eight, I'm over in the farm and the scrap pile, pulling out scrap pieces to nail to a tree, to build a tree fort, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to that, that you learn, Mm -hmm. you know, you learn how to problem solve, you learn how to build something that can take your weight. You learn how to, how to do something that's, that's safe for other people to use and stays up for a while. You know, you learn how to come back the next day because you didn't finish it the day before. Um, and then in the meantime, you're learning how to use the tools and where they go and how to put them back. And there's some accountability that's built in. And that's just not the life that, our, that my kids either have lived. They didn't grow up on a farm. They didn't, you know, they grew up in a time where they talk about having organic food, where that's all we had when I was a kid because we grew our own food. We canned mm-hmm. our own food. We didn't, we didn't buy much in the grocery store other than what we had to buy in the grocery store because we got our, our milk from our, our farm, our meat from our farm, our chickens from the chicken farm, our butter from the, the butter farm down the road. Mm-hmm. You know, we had our own vegetable garden. So, you know, we just, I think it's about putting yourself, being able to put yourself in their shoes so that you're not holding them accountable for what your experience as a kid was. Mm, I like that. I like that. And also too, I think a lot, even with people in general, I mean, everybody wants to go from A to C, but they don't want to do B. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we live in this microwave generation where everybody wants the gratitude. Everybody, everybody wants to get the instant, right? Um, I saw that with, you know, my kids. And I also saw it too, with the apprentices I worked with where, you know, they, they wanted the lineman pay. You know, they saw Lyman made a lot of money and they wanted the Lyman pay, but it's like, Hey kid, you know, you got to learn this stuff or you're not going to have any arms or, or fingers, right, right. <laughs> you yeah. know, or, or you're going to get somebody else killed, you know? So no, it's, it's definitely changed a lot. Um, 
I thank you for sharing that with us and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Cause that, that's pretty cool to see that you grew up the same way. You know what I mean? I, a lot of these guests I have that come on here, all have the same kind of work ethic, all kind of, you know, grew up on a farm or, or, you know, they grew up pretty rambunctious and stuff like that. And I think that's pretty cool that we can come together and collaborate and just share our stories. You know what I mean? It's, it's interesting. Yeah, for sure. Now um, I wanted to ask you as far as trends go. Okay. What information can you share with us about the state of fatherhood that you see today through your eyes? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the last year and a half has provided a, even a greater challenge to what was already challenging. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, for me, for me, I, I grew up with a brother, I had an older brother, and I had uh, male cousins. So I didn't have any sisters, I didn't have any sister, like female cousins. It was just, so to have two daughters was like a whole new world for me. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of work to develop the kind of leadership skills that are needed to raise daughters. And, you know, it, for me, I think that there's a certain amount of, of skills and talents that I have that are helpful when it comes to my kids. But also there's times where I'm like, I, I need, I need some tools on how to better communicate with my daughters because that I don't think the way they do, I'm not built the way they're built. So I don't, I don't process the way they process. And so the things that I'm saying and doing aren't connecting. And when they're not connecting, I'm, I realize that I have to find a different way in and, you know, other than, you know, let's get your mom <laughs> to right. handle this. Um, and I think for, for me, our kids are being challenged a lot more right now. And mm -hmm. especially the last year and a half than, than they typically would be. And, you know, me and other, other men like me have had to grow up early and had to do things at ages that maybe, most kids don't have to do. And, um, but I've, I've watched my kids have to grow up a lot, especially with the timing. I've got one in college and I've got one as a senior in high school this year. Mm -hmm. And what's been put on their plate is, is, is a very much adult thing. Something that you'd have some skill and experience in going through some stuff to be able to handle and navigate the terrain. And when they don't have that and they're getting challenged, there's social challenges and school challenges and online school challenges and all these pieces and all their events are canceled and all the things that make up their childhood that they've known so far are just gone. And now we have mental health to deal with. Now we have, you know, something that we have never had to deal with before as parents. And so we're, I'm my, both my wife and I are looking at this, like, we've got to, we, we've never had to flex this muscle or build this skill before now to help our kids in this situation. So, you know, it's been challenging and we're rising to the challenge, like I think a lot of parents are and a lot of dads are, but it's still challenging to, to, try to try to feel like you are providing what they need when they're being challenged so much more than they ever have been. Absolutely, especially with the culture now today. I mean, this cancel culture and all these different stigmas and everything they're putting on our kids, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's stuff that we never had to deal with. So definitely, this is uncharted waters for us as parents. Um, yeah. I also want to say too, like for daughters, you know, cause I have a daughter, she's a teenager. What I've learned with her is I need to have that connection, you know, with sons, it's different because we can relate with them. You know, they're very spatial. We can throw the ball with them, talk with them, do all kinds of stuff. But with our daughters, you got to have that relationship built before they even take any kind of direction. You know what I mean? Right. They got to know that they're cherished, that they mean more. You know, and um, that's one of the things I had to learn, you, even with my wife, you know, because I, I grew up real stern, real stern. You know, I, you know, I grew up where, you know what I mean? <laughs> if you're going to be yeah. dumb, you, you better be hard. You know, that was the saying. <laughs> right. You know right. I mean? And that's just the way we were. And, you know, you can't expect to do that with your wife or, or your child, you know, and definitely we have to rise to the occasion as parents and just figure out this whole thing we call life because, the biggest thing I think we can teach our daughters is boundaries. That's what I've learned. Boundaries, healthy boundaries, how, teaching them how to set healthy boundaries and say no. Yeah, I, I agree. And, I, and you know, the, the, their, their self-esteem is at risk in so many different ways right now. And mm -hmm. their, their self-worth is being challenged in huge ways. And, 
you know, if they, they say one wrong thing on social media that can be shared and people that are out to make themselves look better by making you look bad will take advantage of that. They're mm-hmm. in a situation where, you know, maybe they're not being canceled altogether, you know, but they are being, their business is being shared at a, an immediate and rapid pace, um, you know, than, than we could ever imagine. We didn't have social media when we were kids. We didn't have that ability for the people to, thank goodness there aren't videos of things that I did. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> right <laughs> you know when, you, when when there's you know the town that i grew up in has 310 people today it's a very very small town and there's just nothing to do and so you get creative and i can imagine if you know i had people that that really were out to hurt me or not my fans of me were recording and sending videos of things that i was doing around to to create problems for me that's a whole other kind of enemy that they're dealing with in a way. Oh yeah, for sure. And it's, it's crazy how many predators that are out there, you know what I mean? Just looking, you know, um, I see more than ever today. A lot of people have the tall poppy syndrome. Yeah. Where if you're starting to move up, you're starting to rise, you know, start doing good. You know, they just kind of want to hold you back down. You know what I mean? And it sucks, but it's something that we got to deal with in our culture, you know? Yeah. Well, that's something that I dealt with a lot. I mean, it's, I dealt with that a lot because I was the first in my family period in any generation of my family to go to college and graduate from college. Mm. And, you know, that, that came up right away. I got out of college. I got a job. I happened to just, just by chance, get some really fantastic clients some of which were very famous at the time. Mm-hmm. And so I was just super excited as a 21 year old to have these famous people, these famous athletes in my schedule. Mm-hmm. And so I went home for Christmas and I was like, you won't believe who I'm working with. And I shared it and they were like, anyway, last night at the bar, so-and-so said this and that. And I was like, oh, <laughs> they took this approach. Like, okay, you think you're special now. Like you, you went to college, you've got a job, you've got these clients. So you think you're better than we are. But that wasn't at all where I'm coming from. I was just trying to share this mm-hmm. joyous thing in my life. But they're like, yeah, we need you to sit down and, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, get, get in your right place here because you're not better than us. And, and that, that's hard because, you know, it's when you, when you don't have, when you haven't left that town, mm-hmm. when you are still in the same town that you were born into and you don't know there's another world, you don't know that there are opportunities available to you. You know, that was the, for me, going to college was finding opportunities mm-hmm. and then showing up in my life and pulling all that hard work that I learned on the farm into schooling and getting scholarships and making it happen. That became a way to get these other opportunities. And I suppose if you've never done that, you wouldn't know that that could lead to opportunities for you and the people that you love. Mm-hmm. I think for me with my daughters, that's something that that is so important that I, I, I share a lot about my story with them. And try to pull as many examples as possible so that they see that while it might be really hard right now, that it's worth going through. It's worth doing, putting in the work and the time and the extra effort, especially with all the online stuff that's going on to, Mm -hmm. to get to an opportunity that's bigger than what you could imagine. No, I, I agree. I mean, just, it's crazy though. Like just to resonate with your story, when I was growing up, I grew up in a small town as well. And if I was to ever tell anybody, cause like you, I was excited, you know, and my parents, every summer we went on vacation, we went all over the country, right. Motorhome. We're, we're like the Griswolds, you know, we right. went to <laughs> South Dakota, Canada, you, you name it, you know what I mean? Right. Yellowstone, whatever. And uh, I'd come home and I'd tell the kids, and this is in elementary. Hey man, check out these pictures, you know, this, that, and, my gosh, next, you know, I'm getting labeled as a bragger. Right. Yeah. You know? And it's like, yeah. and as a child, you don't understand that. You're just like, what did I do? What's so wrong with this? You know what I mean? Yep. You know, but it, it's, it's awful. And you know, it's, it's, you know, it's something that happens today, but we got to just kind of adapt to over and overcome, you know what I mean? But well, I uh, think that's where, I think that's also where we're teaching our kids how to have mm-hmm. empathy so that, you know, it's like, if, you know, we have an experience that they are able to, they, they can experience, but they know that their friends can't and empathizing with their, that friend and knowing that, you know what, it's probably, it may not do them any good to know about this thing, 
mm-hmm. you, you know, telling this particular person or this friend group, um, they might not be able to take it the way you mean it. And so learning how to have empathy and putting yourself in their shoes may help you shift how you speak, not because you shouldn't express yourself, but because you might, you might find it, you learn something by, by hmm. having that empathetic standpoint. Hmm. Hmm. Huh, I never thought of it that way. That's a, that's a good way to look at it. Um, I know Trent, we talked about your, you know, you're growing up and stuff like that. And I want to kind of switch into the subject matter that we have. I know you said you were born with the form of cerebral palsy. Now, how did that affect this whole neuro movement that you're, you're doing now? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, I didn't actually know mm-hmm. that I had cerebral palsy. I was born with cerebral palsy um, my whole childhood and how, it, how it came about, how I became aware of it is that, you know, I had actually, you, you know, listen, growing up on a, on a dairy farm mm-hmm. and then going to college to be a professional dancer is a very unlikely path and a very, right. <laughs> a very, um, strange thing for my friends and peers to understand. Um, so I took a lot of, I took a lot of garbage and a lot of ribbing for wanting to do this. Um, but I'll tell you the reason why I pursued it is because it was my ticket out. Now I was always a natural athlete. I was always athletic, played basketball, you know, and, and I was strong, but when I got into dance, there was so much stretching that it made my body feel better. I didn't know why at the time, I didn't know that I had a condition that might work against me, but it just made me feel so good. And I could also be an athlete at the same time. And then I got a scholarship to go to college to do it. So I was like, well, I'm out of here. I can finally break out of this small town and, and mm-hmm. go someplace and do something with my life. Um, but it was, you know, I, I was, I was performing a lot and I was, you know, training, lifting weights, doing Pilates, running, dancing every day, just like very high end athletic output. And then I would, I woke up one morning and I could, I could really barely walk to the shower. I had so much pain and inflammation from the knees down. I, I just could barely put weight on my feet. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, this, this is a problem. Like this might end everything. Like I, this might not. I may not keep my scholarship. I may, may not be able to finish college because I can't, I can barely walk. And this, this coincided with um, being home for, for Christmas at the time. And I was just complaining to my mom saying, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Like I have so much pain and tightness from my knees down. I just don't get it. And she looked at me and she's like, well, Trent, that's because you were born with cerebral palsy. And I was 19 when she said this to me, wow. <laughs> my, wow. my jaw hit the ground. I'm like, wait, what? She's like, yeah, you know, don't you remember when you were three? And I was like, well, first of all, like who remembers three, but okay, I'm, I'm tracking with you. Like, she's like, yeah, when you were three, when you had the doctors put casts on both of your legs. And then I had this memory. I was like, oh, I do remember having casts on my legs. Um, the extent of my memory was that my brother would, who's five years older than I was, would mm-hmm. put trash bags on them. And then he thought it was funny to throw me in the snowbanks because I could barely move. (laughs) And so that's what, you know, that's what older brothers do. Right. Um, And, but I had to, had that memory. I'm like, yeah, I do remember that. And she's like, well, they they did that instead of doing surgery because you didn't have the ability to put your heels on the ground because of how tight your ankles were. And that was from being born with cerebral palsy. Um, I was like, oh, that's, that's what's going on here. Basically what I was experiencing at 19 was I had just been compensating physically in my body, even though I, I was athletic. I was compensating because I didn't have the range of motion and the balance and the strength in my joints that I would need for the output that I was doing. And so because I was just compensating, I learned to be a master of compensation. Mm -hmm. It led to getting injured, just repetitive stress. Like just if you're working on a line, I mean, just repetitive stress injuries Mm -hmm. that, that caught up with me. And, you know, for the people that don't understand or know what cerebral palsy is, it's, it's, it's actually like the wrong name. I think they should rename this whole thing, but it's a brain injury. It's having a head injury at birth. And, and mine was, a, was, a, was a, like a class one. And there's, there could be up to five classes in a certain way of looking at this. So to class one, you wouldn't really know by looking at me that there was, there was something quote wrong with how I functioned, how I walked. Um, and, but I, and I always thought that my tightness and restriction was normal. I didn't realize that because I didn't have a label. Nobody told me that there was something <laughs> that happened when I was born to cause a problem. Mm-hmm. And, and so that that moment was the start of trying to problem solve 
what started as a brain injury that led to this movement restriction. And I was, avail I was able to rehab my own injury through a, a process of trial and error, trying different exercises and different methods and different modalities mm -hmm. to find a way to rehab. And I, so I rehabbed my own injury. I finished dancing. I danced professionally. But along the way, I was developing a body of work that I would go on to help other people with. So outside of myself, being able to test it in other people that had movement restrictions, had had spinal surgeries, had joint replacements, had suffered a stroke, had Parkinson's, mm -hmm. you know, kids that have focus issues and found that it was something that would work for them. And so it became the start of my life's work, but you have to understand something at the time, there, there was no literature or books to read about brain and the brain being plastic, that it could change, that you had, there, were, there wasn't any, any real easy literature to get your hands on to support this idea. So I was, I didn't really have a language for it. I just had this, this idea, this method that I had that I was working with my clients. Mm -hmm. And, and at some point there started to become literature and books published about the brain. And I thought, well, I better read these because I think this would be good application for what I do with my clients. And as I'm reading them, I'm realizing that this is exactly what I'm already doing. Hmm. And now I have a language to talk about what I've been doing for a long time. And, and so that sort of epiphany was like, oh, there's, there's science to support the work that worked for me first. Mm -hmm. And now I'm sharing with the world. Hmm. That's pretty fascinating that you're able to heal yourself through just these different methods. Um, I got into like neuroplasticity and stuff like that through my wife because she came down with Lyme disease. Hmm. For those who, who knew our, know my story, um, she almost died. And um, she had to completely rechange her thinking through EMDR. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, she, of course. Yeah. She had to completely use that because she had became through the aggressive uh, regiment that she had to partake in to, to battle Lyme through all these pharmaceuticals. It completely destroyed her gut flora to where her body went into shock and started saying, Hey, you're allergic to everything that included foods. I, I think at one time, and I hate to misquote it, but I think she could only eat like 23 different foods and spices. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, it was, it was, it was crazy. I mean, she was so skinny. I mean, we, we thought she, we we're going to lose her for sure. Wow. And uh, she found this program called Annie Hopper's EMDR, right? And she started implementing it and she started, uh, you know, getting books from Dr. Carolyn Leaf, you know, about yeah. neuroplasticity and cognitive therapy and man, it really works. So that's why I was drawn to you and fascinated by your work and how you were able to uh, help people with kind of the same thing, you know what I mean? To focus on improving that sensory input, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that, that's incredible. You know, I, I think that, you know, sometimes when you start talking about brain and science, um, you know, people's eyes can kind of glaze over. Like, I don't know, like, why I should care about this and why this matters. Um, because, but for so long, we, we as a community would, would, would looked at the brain as if once you're an adult, your brain couldn't change. It, it wasn't flexible and couldn't, couldn't adapt new pathways and patterns. So the fact that we know now that it can, that science has proven through research that we can develop new patterns, even under the, some of the most extreme circumstances, you know, someone who has a stroke and part of their brain is really disrupted or destroyed, um, they can learn how to do things with other parts of their brain. It just reroutes those pathways. And that's really powerful information to have when it comes to trying to overcome a limitation or achieve a goal. If you know that as the foundation for how we're wired, that you can literally rewire your brain. That's powerful information to have. Absolutely. And you even look at it too, like professional athletes. I mean, they, they'll close their eyes and they'll focus on the outcome. They'll focus on going through their entire movement. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I know like for me, when I was in the military and I was diving, I would go through every single movement. You know what I mean? From catching my regulator to, to, to bringing down the bubble back down to my mouth to, you know what I mean? Just doing all these little things that I was going to practice underwater, you know? Yeah. It's, it, well, I think what, one of the, you just expressing one of the coolest things about our brain is that it, it, it cannot 
tell a difference between what you're imagining and what's actually happening. It treats mm -hmm. them the same. So when you visualize all those things you just described, your brain experiences it as if it's happened and it's practice. It becomes a real practice that you're reinforcing. And then when you go to do it physically, you've already practiced it. And so you have more success and better outcomes because you've already practiced it and the brain can't tell the difference. It treats them both the same. Hmm. Man, that's so, so fascinating. Um, I read something here about brain speedball. Yeah. I'm super stoked. Can you, can you share with us what that is? Yeah. So the, the brain speed ball is a tool that I invented to make changing the brain simple, mm -hmm. easy, and fun. Because when you start talking about the brain, you can get really, you can, you can get down a rabbit hole real quick about science and what happens and this and that. But my, my idea here was to make this simple and easy and fun for people to do. So the brain speed ball is, a, is actually a bright orange inflatable ball. It's about eight or nine inches. And then it has uh, in black, uh, A through Z and one through 12 printed on it. And so if you and I were playing a game of brain speed ball, then you know, we'd play, be playing a game of catch going back and forth. And I'd be asking you when you cut, when you catch the ball to see the ball come into your hands and then tell me what you see on the ball out loud. So if you caught the ball and you saw the number 10, you would say 10 out loud. You'd throw it back to me, I'd throw it back to you. Then you'd see a, a, the letter A and say A out loud. And this simple game of catch pulls in a significant input to the brain because of how we're, how we're built. Mm -hmm. so, so the brain, you know, we, we collect, collect information through our senses. And the eyes happen to be the most influential sense for our brain. Mm -hmm. So what, what the things that we see and our ability to see play a huge role in how well our brain performs. So it's like this, we're used to looking at our body and thinking like, okay, I want my, my legs and my arms to be strong and flexible and coordinated. And you can look at them and you can see if they're strong and you can see if they're coordinated and you can kind of tend, uh, you know, tend to be able to sense that happening. Mm -hmm. And what we, what we don't tend to look at is how strong and flexible and coordinated are our eyes. And, mm. and so research has proven that we get, when you increase the ability to have better perception, you get better action. And so what that looks like, you know, for, for kids, for example, who are, who are playing this game with the brain speed ball and really firing up their brain, it looks like this. They're, they're getting their eyes to move in many different directions by playing this game with the ball. They are tracking, they're getting their eyes to look in the same, at the same spot at the same time in multiple directions. So it literally is strengthening the muscles of the eyes so the eyes have better function. And what happens is that that's the perception. So you, you actually are strengthening that perception so that the action, their ability to focus, do homework, regulate themselves, calm themselves down, lower their stress, lower their anxiety, that all improves. Wow. That is just amazing how that all ties back in just through our vision. You know, um, there's a quote in the Bible that says my, you know, my people, um, without vision, the people suffer. Right. Right. And I liken it to what you're saying there, because I mean, without that vision being strengthened, you know, in condition, the way this, 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 these type of drills that you're doing, you know what I mean? It, it, people are suffering, you know, with the, you know, they're getting put on Ritalin and stuff like that for things that could be, you know, I don't want to say could be fixed or cannot be fixed with this, uh, these type of drills that you have, you know what I mean? Cause I, I don't know. I mean, could, could that help with kids that have like these learning dysfunctions and stuff like that? Yeah. So let me, let me use my own story as an example, because the other yeah. part of my story is that when I was in third grade, this is before ADD and ADHD was a label. Mm -hmm. Um, my third grade teacher was pretty much exhausted by me in her class and told my parents that I was hyperactive and easily distracted and that they needed to do something about that. Mm -hmm. So they took me to the doctor and they put me on Ritalin and it was, it was terrible because it basically made me like virtually catatonic. I do remember that it was, it was a terrible experience. And, and that was, that was followed by, um, he really struggles with reading. So we need you to work on his reading as well. 
And you know, back then, especially even today, it can be true in a lot of ways where the thing that you really struggle at is the thing they give you more of. <laughs> so yeah. because I struggled at reading, I was slower at my work in school. And at that time, third graders didn't have homework, but I did have homework because I was slow in school. So not only did I have my homework that I couldn't get on to school, my teacher decided that I should have extra reading to do to get caught up. So then I had extra reading and questions to answer every day to try to get caught up. Mm-hmm. And it, it became um, a very sore spot for me because reading was very hard. And all the way through college, I remember getting up in college early in the morning and doing my reading standing up because what would happen for me is I would get one or two sentences into reading whatever I had to do. And it would actually put me to sleep. I'd fall asleep so fast. And it wasn't until I was in my thirties when I met a vision therapist that did some exercises with me that I realized that my whole life, I had a problem with my eyes, that Mm -hmm. both of my eyes didn't converge, that didn't see the same thing at the same time. And that puts a lot of stress on the brain when you have one eye seeing one thing and the other eye seeing something else. And, And that's why reading was hard. It wasn't because I was illiterate or that I couldn't process a word. It's that I literally had my eyes working against me. So if you can just imagine how we how we typically measure eyes, mm-hmm. we, t- we go to, you know, our optometrist or ophthalmologist and we sit, we're not moving. We sit very still and we get measured on acuity for the most part, mm-hmm. how clear something is. So read this chart, top line, second line, third line, and then they, they take you down until you can no longer see to tell whether or not you need glasses. So that's kind of the extent of it. So I didn't need glasses. The way I, I, I could see clearly just fine. I, I had crisp vision, but what wasn't measured was were my eyes working together. And since they weren't reading was very hard for me. And, mm. and so that carried into my life and, and like really created a lot of shame around reading to the point where I would do audiobooks and then say that I read a book because I didn't want to tell people I couldn't quote read, mm-hmm. even though I could read, it just was so problematic. And and when I had worked with that vision therapist was the, the moment where I was like, oh, the eyes are everything. I've, I have to bring these, the sensory training into my work. And that's really where the brain speed ball comes from is, is making what can seem complex and who goes to vision therapists. I mean, not many people commonly go to a vision therapist to have their eyes looked at. And, you know, just circling back to your question, like, can this help people to have learning disabilities? And I wish I had this when I was a kid, because if I had this, I could strengthen my eyes. And mm-hmm. I'll tell you, it's something I have one on my desk I, I, and both of my desks. I use them myself because not only does it help me have an easier time to concentrate and focus and accomplish whatever I'm doing, mm-hmm. but it also reduces the strain of staring at a computer screen all day long. And, you know, for my kids, especially my oldest who's in college, who, who has ADHD, it's how she gets herself back on track. You know, she gets off track and she starts wasting time because she can't focus that's when the brain speed ball comes out and we, and we play a game to help get her back on track so she can sit down again and focus on what she really wants to focus on. Wow. That's, that's amazing how it just brings that center back. You know what I mean? Cause you're right. You know, you're on these, these darn computers. Um, one of our past guests talked about how we're raising the, the first digital natives, you know what I mean? And these kids are spending like upwards of eight to nine hours a day on computers. You know what yeah. I mean? That's, that's just a school. So you can just imagine the amount of stress on their eyes just from staring at these screens, especially, you know, when we're on lockdown and they're doing these virtual uh, zoom meetings and stuff like that, you know, virtual classes. So that that's pretty interesting that getting off of there and then just focusing on this game, you know, this ball that you have created gets you to get your focus back. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And it just takes a few minutes. We're not talking about something that takes a long time either. You know, that's, Mm -hmm. that's the whole idea. It's like, you know, a lot of times I'll get kids that I'm working with one-on-one that they've been to vision therapists and they've been given exercises for their eyes, mm-hmm. but the exercises are really boring and they get their tear off sheet and they're supposed to do their exercises at home, but they don't like them. <laughs> they're not fun. Mm-hmm. And if our brain isn't being stimulated and it's not fun, then we don't, we don't want to do those things. No, who does? I mean, who, who wants to do something that's dry and boring, you know, no. especially as a kid, you don't understand, you don't have a long-term payoff on mind, on your mind. You know, you're just thinking this is boring. I'm not doing this. Um, <laughs> So when you can, when you can have games that are fun that you can do either, you know, with your siblings or your parents or by yourself, um, 
it's awesome. And especially for dads, I mean, for me as a dad to be able to play these games with my kids, mm-hmm. it does, it does, you know, break down some barriers and allow for some other conversations mm-hmm. to happen. And that, that's a nice side effect of the whole thing too. You're talking about, you know, playing catch with your dad or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's similar, but, but it also, you know, they, they feel supported. And so for, for my daughters to feel like their dad is supporting them is really important to me. Um, not, not just that they hear me say, I'm here to support you, but they feel what that feels like. And they see what that, that looks like. No, I, I agree with you. Um, Dr. Michael Gurian out of the Gurian Institute in Spokane, Washington, he's always talking about how he deals with the children and fathers, right? Mm-hmm. And he said one of the things he likes to do in his practice is he likes to throw the ball with the dad. When they come in there or a child comes in there and they're dealing with issues, he'll throw a tennis ball back and forth with them. And he says that that gets them to open up because men are spatial. So when you're throwing a ball, they're paying attention to that and they're answering questions and they're more in tune. They're more in line with you. You're, you're making that connection with them. Right. And he said that uh, that's why when you ask kids or, or boys, you know, what do you remember about your father? A lot of times it'd be like, I remember my dad used to play catch, hmm. you know? So I thought that, that you got something there, man. It definitely. Cause I, I mean, it's pretty, p- pretty interesting how it all ties in together, you know, especially, I mean, just this, this ball, that you have, you know, it could be even used for kids with sports. I mean, I'm sure it oh, helps them with so, sports, oh, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the thing is that right now I have um, three programs that we, we focus on. One is for kids mm-hmm. and then th- that one's alive and available. And the other two that are coming in the next couple of months is one is for seniors and the other one is for athletes. And the really fun thing about athletes is that, especially if, if they're kids, but any athlete at any age, you know, you think about the sport you're playing and how, how much you have to use your eyes. If you're playing with a, a sport with a ball, you've got to track the ball mm-hmm. coming towards you, moving away from you, where it is in space, your relationship to it. And the, the better you're able to do that through having strong, flexible, coordinated eyes and visual system, the better your athletic performance is. And you think about, you know, I think about like a, a hitter up to up to bat in a baseball game and they've, they're standing sideways and with their head turned looking toward the pitcher and so in in doing that process they're asking both eyes to look to their left and to see that ball before they hit it and as it comes into their bat and if you imagine having a weakness in your eyes where you don't have the ability to look at that ball mm-hmm. you're going to miss the ball because you literally don't see it or in addition to that, you're going to compensate in your body. So you don't have as powerful of a swing because you're compensating to be able to see the ball that you can't get your stance right. Mm-hmm. And think of how many, how many coaches and parents are like trying to fix their kid's stance. And it's really a visual issue because they're standing the way that they can see the ball. Wow. That just definitely just changes perspective like crazy. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, um, and it's so true because you will compensate. And yeah. Like for me, I didn't know, like I knew I had to wear glasses. I just didn't like to wear glasses. So when I'd be climbing as an apprentice, you know, I never wore my glasses or anything like that. And I can climb and do whatever, you know. And then all of a sudden I had a a lineman ask me one day, he's like, hey, Dave, is that cut out open or closed? And I glanced and I was squinting and, oh yeah, it's, it's open. And he looked at me, he's like, oh you dumb, you know what? He's like, oh, that thing's closed. What's wrong with you? Let me see. He's like, oh, you know what? You need to wear your glasses. You're going to get somebody killed. I want you to wear your glasses. You know what I mean? Right, right. I I still remember that, you know, uh, there's a guy named Mark Epperson, God rest him. He he passed away, but uh, he told me that, you know, and ever since then I wore my glasses, but getting to back to what I was saying, as soon as I put those glasses on, it was like a whole different new world, bro, because now everything, I could see everything. I could even my climbing changed, you know what I mean? Right. Cause now right. I'm not compensating for the lack of the visual acuity that I, that I had. If that right. makes sense. You yeah. Know? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, to think about the other piece that happens when you're, when you're playing this game is that you have your visual tracking, you're increasing the strength of your eyes, but mm-hmm. how our brains work is that every time you have information coming in through your senses um, you're deciding what to do about it and then you're acting on it. So mm-hmm. that that's a cycle. It's a sense decide, 
act cycle that happens. Mm -hmm. And that's happening in our brain all the time. And so when you're, when you're playing with the brain speed ball, you're tapping into that cycle. So you're sensing where the ball is in space and then what's on the ball and how you're seeing it. You decide to catch it and say it out loud. And then you act on it by catching it and saying it out loud. And by playing this game over and over again, you're actually reinforcing how our brains are already wired and built to function without making it challenging in terms of like strenuous brain work. It's just a fun game, but you're reinforcing something that your brain needs to be fed and you're exercising your eyes at the same time. So it's like this one, two punch that happens mm. in under five minutes that can take you from not being able to see the ball to being able to hit a home run, um, running slow to running quickly. Cause you can coordinate your body better when your eyes function better. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, if you're, if you're having to, um, you know, know, like, for example, I, I work with some volleyball players and they have to be able to anticipate the line of the ball as it's coming toward them before the ball is going there. Cause they've got to get their arms out where the ball is going to end up. Mm -hmm. And so you're faster at understanding where that trajectory and that line is because your body is more organized and already ahead of solving that problem. Hmm. How I wanted to ask you, how can alignment or, or apprentice or tradesman implement this neuro movement tools right yeah. away in any situation, like for, you know, just personal use or help with even limitations, you know what I mean? Cause I, I know a lot of linemen, you know, um, back of the day, lead was really big and we would put cotter keys in our mouth and stuff. Mm, sure. And uh, some of the linemen I worked with from the high line, they had Parkinson's and they would shake. And they said it was because of the lead that they're putting in their mouth. You know what I mean? And I don't know if that's true or not. You know what I mean? I just know that that's what they would tell me. And they would have the shakes real bad. It's probably because they needed alcohol or something. You know what I mean? But right. that's, that's what one of the, uh, the linemen told me. And he's like, I'll drink milk. He's like, that'll help you with the, uh, the effects from putting that lead in your mouth, you know, um, how, how would that help? You know what I mean? As far as implementing this whole training that you have. Yeah. You know, we, we, in my facility, we have um, several clients over the years that have that have mm -hmm. Parkinson's, um, and it's, it's some of the most fun because it, it's really challenging for them. You know, especially as they start to lose uh, certain abilities in their body, uh, that they can feel like their mind is primed as much as it can be, and that they they can keep themselves balanced as much as possible. You know, it certainly doesn't reverse the condition, but we see much more success in staying off some of the side effects and symptoms and feeling as empowered as you can by playing the ball. Um, so some of the things that people will notice just by playing is just feeling like you're ready for what's next. You're ready. Your, your, your awareness and your attention is primed for what you're about to do. So if you're about to go on the line, then you, you, you have a sharpness about you and, mm. and awareness and anticipation of what's coming. Um, that can really prepare you. If you had a really long, stressful day, it's a really great way to regulate yourself, calm yourself down, kind of restore the balance in your brain and your mind. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that can do that, but you know, sometimes they're not within reach. Like so for some people who meditate, if meditation like is not your bag, it's just like, I don't know how to do that. I don't really get it. Not my thing, but you've, you've, you know, most people have played a game with the ball. So it feels familiar. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it seems like, yeah, this is a normal thing that you do. You, you bounce a ball against the wall. I mean, I threw a ball on my garage roof and for my whole childhood <laughs> yeah. or in the barn against the wall, you know, bouncing this and that ball. So it's something that feels familiar, but it taps into a cycle that just reg relaxes and regulates your mind so that you can find a quick resolve for a stressful day, or you can prime yourself to get ready for your day. Man, and, and Trent, I'm, I'm, I'm totally sold. I mean, before you get off, I, I need you to tell our audience, you know, because I think this is a tool that would highly benefit, you know, not only my brothers and sisters in the line trade, but even just blue collar workers or fathers in general, you know what I mean? Getting off their job, you know, wanting to implement because, you know, at, at the show up, dad, we always talk about being intentional with your children and spending that quality time. Well, what better way to spend quality time, relieve stress and build up these dynamics that are going to be better used for setting up our kids to have a, a better future and yourself as well. You know? Yeah. yeah Cause it's something you can play your whole life. That's a great point. No, it's, 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 it's absolutely fascinating. I, I'm totally sold. Um, Trent, once again, brother, thank you for coming on here and just sharing this amazing information, brother. Um, 
Can you share with our audience how they can order one of these or how they can get a hold of you or anything like that? I, I deeply appreciate that, man. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd invite you to go to fireupyourbrain.com and you can read about the different programs. And the kids program is available right now and the seniors and athletes is coming out in the next couple of months here, but you can mm-hmm. read all about the content. And I'll tell you, um, it, you know, the it, this training and the ball come together. And, you know, in a, in a world where we don't want to be in front of our computers any longer than we have to mm-hmm. know that the training is really simple, but it really guides you step by step through, through being able to implement this um, with your kids and your kids can watch the videos too and learn how to play the games. And, inc- and in fact, we encourage kids to come up with their own games once they have an idea of, you know, the basic rules of playing the game. So the training walks you step by step through that whole process so that you can feel confident. And then also, in addition to that training, know that you're not alone. So I do a, a, a monthly program called Ask Trent, and that's where I actually um, send out an email, ask for questions, and then I go live and share answers to the questions that people are asking, and then provide the video so you can access access videos later on and and know that you know you're you're not really on your own. You have the training, you have the ball, but you also have the ability to ask any questions and and get some answers and learn from others. Absolutely. And that's the whole point of this is just to learn from others and just try to be the best version of yourself you possibly can. That way you can just give yourself away. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's what we look forward to. And once again, Trent, thank you so much for coming on here and just sharing with us your, your past and, and your future and everything else that you got going, man. And you're an amazing dude, bro. And I look forward to uh, talking to you more. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much.